Amen. All right. Well, this morning, we are going to be wrapping up our series that we've been doing, our Built Different series. We've taken this month of June to really dive into the book of Ephesians. We've been looking um, for the last five chapters. We've talked about how we are built on a firm foundation, how we are built for unity, how we are built for growth. And last week, Ariane talked about how we are built for daily discipleship. The book of Ephesians really lines out our identity as believers in Christ and also so how we're called to live as that. And so if you've missed any of the weeks, I encourage you go back, listen on our podcast, or you can find the sermons on YouTube or on both of those places under His Church AZ so that you can catch up. And we've been encouraging you each week to also be reading through the book of Ephesians on your own as well. We're covering a passage of the chapters each Sunday, but this is an incredible book to familiarize yourself with, to read through all the way. So we're going to dive into chapter six today. Um, and as we do, we're going to see how we are built for battle. We're going to look at Paul's final words here to the church at Ephesus. And you know, final words can be pretty meaningful. Final words are usually important. They're usually the kind of thing that you want to lean in for, that you want to really make sure that you're grasping and understanding. It reminds me of a time about 10 years ago, uh, Ariane and I got, got away for a couple days for our 10-year anniversary, 10 years ago. We're about to hit 20 years this October, um, but we were celebrating our 10th anniversary, and we had gotten away for a few days to Mexico. We're sitting on the beach, and we're watching in this particular day so many people paragliding. Maybe some of you have done that before, like you're strapped up to the back of this boat with kind of like a parachute thing, and the boat takes off, and you're gliding over the ocean. Ocean. I am totally fine to never do that. I am okay to just watch that, to see other people enjoying that. But we're sitting there watching it, and all of a sudden, Arian says, I want to try that. I think I'm going to go try that. So we walk down to the shoreline. The boat had just come back in, and, and he just asks the guy, you know, I, th I think I'd like to try it. Can you tell me about it? You know, and the guy's like, you want to do it? And Arian says, yes. And within, let me tell you, th like three minutes tops, they already have Arian strapped up. While they're strapping him up, they're shouting instructions to him while they're like tightening all the things. And then like before, you know, bam, he's off. And I was like, wait, what just happened? Like these instructions were things like how to land so you don't break your legs, like how to hold your body in the air so that you stay in the proper alignment and you stay up in the air, like very important, vital things. And I was like, wait a minute. They didn't even pause to make sure he understood. And here I am like shouting, did you get that? Did you understand? Don't break your legs. Um, so thankfully, he got it, but those closing instructions shouted very quickly. But when we hear closing instructions, they're usually weighty. They're usually important and meaningful. So here we are. We're going to look as Paul concludes this book to the church of Ephesus. And I'm going to be reading Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. And I want to encourage you. These are not verses to just breeze through. These are verses to really lean into, to pause. And so I'm going to ask, we're going to just pray and ask God to open our hearts. Holy Spirit, I pray that as we read your word, I pray that you would cause it to come to light in our hearts, in our spirits, in a way that maybe it never has before. God, if this is a familiar passage, I pray that you would give us a fresh, fresh revelation through it and that you would work your will in and through us, God, as we read your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to read these eight verses from two different translations. That's a really great way to study the Bible is to read a passage in different translations so that you can really understand it. So I'm going to start in the New Living Translation. And it says this, a final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so that you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. 
I'm going to read it again out of the message translation, which is a paraphrase translation, and I love the way that it words this passage as well. It says, and that about wraps it up. God is strong, and he wants you to be strong. So take everything the master has set out for you, well-made weapons of the best materials, and put them to you so that you will be able to stand up to everything the devil throws your way. This is no afternoon athletic contest that we'll walk away from and forget about in a couple hours. This is for keeps, a life or death fight to the finish against the devil and all his angels. Be prepared. You're up against far more than you can handle on your own. Take all the help you can get, every weapon that God has issued, so that when it's all over but the shouting, you'll still be on your feet. Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, and salvation are more than words. Learn how to apply them. You'll need them throughout your life. God's word is an indispensable weapon. In the same way, prayer is essential in this ongoing warfare. Pray hard and long. Pray for your brothers and sisters. Keep your eyes open. Keep each other's spirits up so that no one falls behind or drops out. So this book of Ephesians is wrapping up talking about spiritual warfare. For the Ephesian culture of that day, this made sense. In the city of Ephesus and the surrounding cities, there were temples to over 50 different gods. And so thinking about the spiritual realm was was very normal to them. Most of them thought about the spiritual realm. But nowadays in our culture, most people, I would even say most Christians, don't think about the spiritual realm as often as we really should. So in Ephesians 6, God is calling our attention to it. But not just so that we'll be aware that it exists, but so that we will realize that we're already in a battle in this realm and that God has equipped us with every single thing that we need to be victorious in this battle. The first directive we find here in this passage of scripture is this, be strong in the Lord. And I want you to say that phrase in the Lord with me. Okay, so on the count of three, one, two, three, go, in the Lord. That is the important key phrase to remember here, to be strong in the Lord. He is reminding us that victory in this battle has nothing to do with our own strength. It has everything to do with God's strength. And you know why that's good news? Because maybe you don't feel strong right now. Maybe you feel a little bit overwhelmed right now. Maybe you feel weak right now from the things that you've been walking through or carrying. But can I tell you, you can still be victorious in the midst of that. Because if the call, if, if the goal for us as followers of Christ is dependence on God, and it is, that is literally how God calls us to live, is dependent on him. If that is the goal, then weakness isn't a setback. It's actually what helps us accomplish what God calls us to. We read that in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, when God tells us that his power is made perfect in our weakness that he can equip us, that he can empower us so that we're operating in a better strength, in a greater strength when we depend on him than we ever are when we just try to do life on our own. God is not telling us to just try harder. God is not telling us to just buck up and do better and get your stuff together and just go out there and do a better job than what you're already doing. That's not the message of the gospel. And yet in our Americanized Christianity, that's sometimes what is portrayed. It's sometimes portrayed that we just need to live better lives, that we just need to be better people, that we just need to try harder and do more and try harder to do more. But that's not what we find in the gospel when we read the Bible. The actual message of the gospel and what we are reading about in Ephesians 6 is that we can't do this on our own, that it's more than what we have, that we are up against far more than we can handle on our own. And so it's not just about trying harder. It's about doing it the right way. It's about remaining dependent on God and being strong in the Lord because God equips us. All that we need, we find in him and in his word. So no matter what we're facing and no matter how we feel, we can be strong because it's in God's strength. The second directive we find here is to put on the whole armor of God. And again, I love how the message translation breaks it down by saying truth, righteousness, peace, faith, and salvation are more than words. Learn how to apply them because you'll need them throughout your life. When I was growing up, my mom would pray the armor of God over me every single day. 
And I mean every single day. She would do this in the car as we were on our way to school. She would pray the armor of God over me. And if it wasn't a school day or we were on a break, she would sit me on the couch and she would pray the armor of God over me. And when I got old enough, she would have me pray it over myself. And I don't just mean like pray it or read it. I mean, she would have me put on the armor of God. Okay, so we're here and she's praying. She's like, come on, Allie. All right, you got to put it on. So it's like the belt of truth. The bre- Here I am like doing the hand motions, the breastplate of righteousness the shoes of peace. Okay, I've got the helmet of salvation on mom. Every single day of my childhood that I can remember, my mom prayed the armor of God over me. So I can, let me just tell you that when I reached my teenage years, there was definitely like some eye rolling that also went into this whole like, you know, helmet of salvation, sword of the spirit, shield of faith, blah, blah, blah. That's kind of how it felt like as you prayed it every day. But let me tell you, it was in me, right? Like I knew what the armor of God was. And I knew what it was intended for. And while I didn't always apply it the right way, while I didn't always walk in it or benefit from it, I knew it. And those were seeds that were sown into my spirit that have grown as I have grown in the Lord and as I have come to know God better. And today we're gonna look at these pieces of armor. What I love about this armor of God is that the Bible takes an attribute of victory and it pairs it with a piece of armor so that we can understand what is happening in the spiritual realm. So we can understand how God equips us in the spiritual realm. We take the attribute of victory and we pair it with this piece of armor and we understand how we are meant to live as we face the battles we find ourselves facing. So the first piece listed is the belt of truth. I've got some props up here with me today, so we're gonna look at it as we talk about it. But the belt of truth is the starting place. You know, the devil's go-to weapon is deception. So we have to know the truth if we're going to beat the enemy's schemes. The Bible calls Satan the father of lies, meaning that he will always lie. So without the truth, we can easily fall prey to the enemy's blurring of the lines like he likes to do. The questions he throws our way to cause us to doubt. Questions like, did God really say that? Did God really mean that? Does God really hear your prayers? Do you really think God cares about you and what you're going through? The questions that he has literally been asking since the Garden of Eden, and he continues to throw our way. He is the father of lies, and he is a mastermind in deception, which means that he knows how to take a lie and spin it so that it looks true. And we see that happening all around us in our culture today. People believing lies, that are presented as truth. He's also called the accuser. And often we hear those accusations in our minds. We hear him accusing us over and over again because he attacks us in our minds. Accusations that cause us to dislike ourselves, that cause us to even hate ourselves. Things like you'll never be enough. You'll always be broken. You'll never be able to get past that. You'll never be able to hear. You're too far gone. If you really were to show people who you really are, they would leave. So don't open up. Those things that he he throws, you're unlovable. Nobody's gonna say all of those things are accusations. God never speaks to us like that. So when you begin to have those accusing thoughts in your mind, when you begin to think those things, we've got to be aware that that is the accuser attacking us in our minds. God doesn't speak to his children that way, but the enemy does. We've got to recognize the lies from the enemy and God equips us to do that. And we've got to combat those lies with truth. For the Roman soldiers of that day, their belt was the piece of armor that everything else linked to. Their breastplate would link to that. Their sword would link to that. Their shield would link to that. It literally was the central piece of armor that held everything else together. Again, for the people of Ephesus, they would have been very familiar with this because they saw Roman soldiers everywhere they looked. It was a part of their everyday life. So they understood this kind of terminology. For us, maybe that's not really the case. Maybe this is a little bit more familiar to you. When I think of the belt of truth, again, putting on an imaginary belt my whole life, when I think of the belt of truth, I think of a back brace kind of belt a belt that goes around, that keeps you, that gives you the core support and keeps you standing upright, right? It guards your whole body. It keeps your whole body strong and protected and secure and firm. 
because that is what the belt of truth is. The belt of truth is our core support. It is what we need at our core to know the truth of God's word so that we can remain upright in a world that is spinning like crazy, right? In a world that is shifting like crazy, we need to be able to remain upright. And that is what the belt of truth allows us to do. It gives strength and support to our entire being. As this piece of armor would keep a soldier physically sturdy, that's what the belt of truth does for us spiritually. And like a soldier's belt, God's truth is meant to be what everything else in our life links to. Our relationships, our habits, what we allow our minds to think about, how we make our decisions, the things that we pursue in life, all of that is meant to be linked to the belt of truth. So practically speaking, We're going to talk with each piece of armor what it looks like to do more than just say it or read it. How do we live this out? How do we apply it more than just going through the motions, right? How do we actually apply the armor of God in our everyday life? Let's start with the belt of truth. Practically speaking, you apply the armor of God by believing the word of God, by applying the word of God, that when you read the word of God, you begin to live it out. You begin to allow it to change your life. You make God's truth the standard by which you live. Not culture, not what other people are saying, not your own desires. You make God's word the standard by which you live. You commit yourself to it unapologetically and you allow it to shape your life. You also have to make sure that you have the right belt on, okay? The Bible calls it the belt of truth. It's not the belt of feelings. It's not the belt of your past experiences. It's not the belt of your knowledge. It's not the belt of legalism. Doing all the right things is not gonna keep you upright, walking in victory for what God has for you. It's called the belt of truth. And the Bible tells us in the book of John that the truth of God sets us free. It sets us free from the lies of the enemy and it sets us free from the sin that keeps us trapped and bound. The second piece of armor we find as we read is the breastplate of righteousness. Satan is going to come after whatever part of you isn't surrendered to God. If you've given God this part, but like, I'm not going to quite give God all of me, he's going to come for that part and he's going to attack it. Proverbs 4.23 says to guard your heart above all else because everything else in your life flows out of what's happening in your heart. Physically, a soldier had to protect his heart because a heart wound could be fatal, When we talk about our hearts in the spiritual sense, we're referring to the seat of our emotions. We're referring to what goes on in here, how we feel, how we think, how we are directing our lives. That's what we're talking about when we talk about our heart because what goes on in here impacts everything else that goes on about us out here. So this is why the Bible, it's it's what it means when it says that our lives flow out of our hearts. That's what we read in Proverbs. And that's what it means. What happens in here is gonna impact everything that happens out here. And that is why we have to guard our heart. It's also why we see the enemy throwing around a really believable lie that says, follow your heart, right? We see it everywhere. We see it like painted on like Christian things. We see it posted on Christian things. It can look so pretty. It can look so eye-catching. It can be this statement that you want to believe, follow your heart. That's not biblical. The world says, follow your heart. God says, guard your heart, protect your heart and follow him. Because how many of you know that your heart can lead you down a path that isn't wise for you? down a path that isn't right for you, down a path that doesn't honor God. When we talk about righteousness, the breastplate of righteousness, we're talking about two things, right standing and right living. One of them God gives us and the other one we choose to live out. God gives us right standing with him when we come into relationship with him. Second Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. God gives us his righteousness through salvation. When we come to God and we repent of our sins and we we receive his gift of salvation, he covers us in his righteousness. So if you're a follower of Christ, you're not righteous only when you feel righteous. When you feel like you're doing all the right things, you feel like you're walking in holiness, you read your Bible enough this week, you're not righteous when you feel righteous. You're righteous because of what Jesus did for you on the cross. 
because his blood was shed for you. He gave you right standing with God if you are a follower of Christ. But the second part of righteousness is right living. It's living in a way that honors God's standards. Like Arian talked about last week, that because we have been saved and because we have been given the spirit of God in our lives, we live like it. We live like we are followers of Christ. We don't just say it. We bring our lives up to that. This piece of armor is referred to as the breastplate of righteousness because it means that that kind of living is what guards our hearts. Right standing and right living protects and guards us against wrong choices, the wrong choices that would seek out to ruin us. So practically, here's how you apply the breastplate. You put off all the other things that Paul has talked about through the book of Ephesians. You put off lies and anger. You put off all of these different things, immorality, impurity, all of the things that the Bible tells us about, harsh words, slander. We've read them as we've gone through Ephesians, stealing, bad language, sexual immorality, greed, foolish talk, and coarse jokes. You put it off. And here's the thing, like you would expect something like impurity to be in there. But did you also catch that it said bad language, harsh words, foolish talk, coarse jokes? Sometimes we make allowance for those things because we're like, oh, it's just part of who I am. It's just become a habit. It doesn't really mean anything. I'm going to go here not to step on anyone's toes, but we say things like, I love Jesus, but cuss a little, right? Like, What is the word telling us right here? The word of God is telling us, don't make space in your heart for things that pollute your heart. Don't make space in your life. Don't make justifications and allowances for things in your life that pollute your life, that pull you away from what God is trying to do in your life. Yes, God has given you right standing, but we also have to choose right living. So we have to put off the old so that we can put on the new so that we have room and space to put on the new. So you accept the gift of God's righteousness and you choose the right living of righteousness, which again has been lined out in Ephesians, humbleness, gentleness, patience, unity, kindness, tenderheartedness, forgiveness, and love. Again, we're not perfect. We're not gonna be perfect, but this is a standard. It's a standard to seek after. It's a standard to recognize in ourselves, to take some inventory. How am I living? What is my behavior showing? Putting on the breastplate of righteousness really comes down to our daily choices of putting off the bad stuff so we can put on the right stuff. Getting rid of the wrong so we make room for the right. The next piece of armor we find is the shoes of peace. All four of our boys play sports. And with that comes buying a lot of different pairs of shoes. There are, you know, football cleats, which are different from baseball cleats, which are different from soccer cleats. And then it's like basketball season and you got to get the sneakers with the good grip. So you're not, you know, going all around or now they make grip spray. Okay. Those of you raising kids, you know, right? You're with me on this so that you're not slipping around the court. So you're getting all these different pairs of shoes, right? So as, as a parent, that gets expensive. The kids love it. They're like, yay, another pair of shoes, another pair of sneakers for the parents. It gets expensive, but certain kinds of shoes help an athlete to play better. Certain kinds of shoes help them to really get their footing. It is part of their equipment, and I do get it. They're not gonna play well. They're not gonna play their best if they're slipping all around, if they can't get a grip, if they can't get their footing on the field or on the court. And in this culture that we live in that is ever-changing, ever-evolving, ever-updating, this culture that promotes slippery trends, it's no wonder that we see so many people just sliding through life, grasping for some sort of stability. So God talks about what we should have on our feet. The same way that I buy my boys shoes that will help them with sports, God has specifically designed shoes for us that help us live our lives well also so that we can stand and walk and advance down the path that he has for us. And it's the shoes of peace. You know, what's on your feet goes with you everywhere that you go. Everywhere that you are walking that day, your shoes go with you. Every conversation that you go into, every situation, every encounter, every opportunity, what is on your feet is going with you. God intends for us to take his peace with us everywhere we go. 
so that every situation we find ourselves in, every battle that we find ourselves facing, every decision that we find ourselves making, we carry God's peace with us, that God's peace is leading the way, that God's peace is helping us keep our footing, that God's peace is what is rooting us in our relationship with him. And that peace doesn't come from how you feel. It doesn't come from your circumstances. The Bible tells us that the peace of God comes from God. John 14, 27, Jesus says, I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and peace of heart. And the peace I give is a gift that the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Jesus is literally saying, I will give you my peace. And I see how all of this is gonna work out. I see how all of this is gonna go. And so I'm gonna give you peace to trust me when you can't see it. When you don't see the victory yet, when you're not walking in the answered prayer yet, you can still walk in peace. So peace isn't this pansy emotion. It's not just this inward zen that we feel when everything in our lives is going smoothly and there's no chaos. No, that's not what the Bible tells us peace is. Peace is a tool that God gives us. It is a weapon that we are able to wield. It is a piece of armor that keeps us strong. And we have access to it through the Holy Spirit. So how do we practically put on the shoes of peace? Well, I would would just encourage you to remember, think about this in the morning when you wake up to put on your own shoes. You choose your shoes, right? What all of you chose the shoes you wore today. What shoes go best with this outfit? You choose your shoes. When you wake up every morning, choose to put on the shoes of peace. Choose to say, God, I'm gonna walk in your peace today no matter what I find myself up against. I'm not gonna let all my circumstances throw me into a spinning crazy cycle. I'm gonna walk in your peace. You get to choose the shoes and let God steady you. Next, we find ourselves at the shield of faith. So we've got our shield of faith here. And you know, we hear the word faith used so often, I think sometimes we become desensitized to it. But I want to read to you the definition of faith. Faith is when you live like God is speaking the truth. Faith is when you believe God's word, regardless of what you see. This is so important because the enemy is going to send fiery darts constantly over and over again to defeat you and to distract you. John 10, 10 tells us that the enemy always and only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He is never coming to just party with you. He is always coming to steal from your life, to kill your spiritual life, and to destroy you and your relationship and your marriage and your friendships and your kids and your future, always and only. That's what he shows up to do. And so because the shield is our source of protection, he's going to constantly come after it. The enemy's goal is to keep you separated from God. And yes, he does this through temptations, hoping we'll sin, but he also does this through distraction, keeping us so distracted that we feel like we don't have time for God, keeping us so distracted that we're just running around in these busy circles that we don't spend time intentionally building our faith, keeping us so distracted scrolling through social media that we're like, oh man, I don't have time to read my Bible. And yet, if you were to look right now, pull up your time usage that your phone tells you, I bet you'd find right there some time. Me too. Not pointing the finger, I'm saying me too. He keeps us distracted with so much noise, with so much chaos, with so much busyness that we don't have time to just sit with ourselves and think about eternity, our relationship with God, how we live out our purpose how we walk in the things that God has for us, how we get to know the heart of God better. If the enemy can keep us so distracted that we don't spend time with God, then he keeps us weak and susceptible to further attack. If he can get your shield down, you're open. If he can damage your faith, which is what the Bible says is our protection, then you're open to further attack because you don't have what God has given you as protection. Our faith in God's truth is what protects our lives. So again, practically, how do you use your shield? You get in the word of God. 
You get to know what God's word says. Roman tells us that faith comes by hearing the word of God. So as you sit in church on Sundays and you hear the word of God, but then Monday through Saturday, you're getting in the word of God so that your faith can continue to grow. You've got to intentionally limit the distractions and noise in your life so that you have time to sit with God. You gotta remind yourself of God's faithfulness in the past because that builds your faith. And James 4, 7 tells us that if we will submit to God and resist the enemy, he will flee. The next piece we come to is the helmet of salvation. I borrowed my son's football helmet for this. Helmets are made for protection, but if you want the full benefit of the helmet, this isn't gonna work. You have to actually put it on. Right? You have to actually wear it and apply it. And just like having the helmet in your possession isn't really enough to protect your head, receiving salvation from God isn't where he intended that to stop. Yes, it does guarantee us eternity with God in heaven, but salvation is for us to live out here as well on earth. It's for this present tense. God gives us the benefit of salvation here. Our minds affect our lives in huge ways because what we think about, we gravitate towards. And what we gravitate towards makes its way into our lives. And so we have to keep our minds guarded. The Bible tells us to take our thoughts captive, meaning that we won't allow ourselves to dwell on thoughts that are contrary to the word of God. That is the way that our salvation renews our minds. It reminds us of our identity in Christ so that we can say, I'm not gonna think the same way that I thought when I wasn't walking with God. I'm not gonna allow my mind to focus on the same kinds of things and thought patterns that I did when I wasn't walking with God. I'm not gonna allow myself to go down those same negative downward spirals that I did when I wasn't walking with God because my salvation renews my mind. It reminds me of who I am in Christ. It reminds me of what his word says about me. So we have to ask ourselves, does that thought line up with God's truth? And that is what our salvation allows us to do. So again, in our everyday lives, here's how we put on and apply the helmet of salvation. You may have received salvation. You may be walking with the Lord, but is your salvation the filter for what you think about? Do you run everything through your salvation, through your right standing with God? Again, does it line up with the word of God? Filter it out. Change your thought. Interrupt that thought and switch your thinking. Don't allow yourself to dwell there. Dwell on the promises of God and his truth. Think about what you're thinking about. Don't just let your mind wander. Stop it if it's wandering in the wrong direction. Speak out what God says about you and your situations. Dwell on that. In the book of Ephesians alone, we find so much great truth. God has called us his own. We are his sons and daughters. We have an inheritance as children of God. I am who I who God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. The book of Ephesians gives you so many truthful, powerful things to think about instead of the directions our minds choose to go. And lastly, with this one, refuse to empower the enemy by believing his lies. Refuse to empower. When you come into alignment, when you allow your mind to dwell on a lie of the enemy, you're empowering the liar. You're giving him greater power and access over your mind. Change that thought. Speak God's word over the direction the enemy is trying to take your mind. That is what it means to take your thoughts captive, to allow your salvation to guard and protect your mind. And then we come to maybe everyone's favorite piece of armor, the sword of the spirit. It's the only offensive piece of armor listed as we look at all of these different pieces. God is telling us that we can't always just stay on the defensive if we want victory in our spiritual lives. We're gonna have to be intentional and strategic. And we do this through wielding our sword, right? It's awesome. Got a sword, the sword of the spirit. Paul tells us that by wielding our sword, we gain victory over the enemy. But the sword of the spirit is the word of God. 
We wield the word of God in our lives. So when you feel like the devil is all up in your face, he's all up in your family, he's all up in your situations, you gotta start wielding the word of God. You've gotta wield the sword of the spirit so that you can be on the offensive when he comes to attack. This isn't just nice reading for when you have extra time. This isn't just if I have a few extra minutes, maybe I'll try to read the word of God. This is your lifeline. This is what you go into battle with. You don't just want defensive pieces of armor. You also want something to fight with, to move forward with, to advance with. And that's what this is. That's what the word of God is. I think we all think it'd be pretty cool to walk through life like this, right? Like you're walking up to a situation and someone starts to say something, they're not gonna say something if they see this, right? You, you pull this out and you're like, what was that? What, what was that you just said? Right, we, we see the enemy attacking. You wanna walk up and you wanna be like, okay, what was that? You see what I have here? This would be so cool to walk through life like this. We don't live in that day and age, okay? But we have this and what we have to get in our mind, again, the attribute of victory with the piece of armor. This is what this is in the spiritual realm. You know the word, you speak the word, you apply the word, you go into battle with the word of God. When there is an attack, again, we don't battle people. People are not the enemy. The enemy is the enemy. So we battle with the word of God. That is the sword of the spirit. God does give us something really cool to wield around. And it is his word. It is his heart. It is his message. And it holds power. It's not just words written on a page. There's power in the word of God. So we, we, we apply this practically by knowing the word, by believing it, living it, speaking it out. Romans 8, 28, that God knows how to turn all things around for the good of those who love him. So if you're walking through something hard that you say there could be nothing good coming from this, God knows how to turn it around and bring good from it. And you speak that out, Philippians 1, 6, that he who began a good work in you will carry it through to completion. Not just maybe, not just if you act right, he will do it. He is faithful and the word of God actually says you can be confident in it that he will finish the work he started in you. Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can walk in wisdom through Christ who strengthens me. I can learn to control my anger through Christ who strengthens me. I can make good decisions through Christ who strengthens me. I can be a better spouse through Christ who strengthens me. I can parent my kids well through Christ who strengthens me. This is how you wield your sword. Isaiah 41, 10, God will uphold you with his right hand. You're not doing it alone. Ephesians 3, 20, my God is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than I can ask or think. Everything you find yourself up against, God gives you a promise. God gives you the promise of his presence. God gives you the promise of his word. And this is how we battle. And I know a lot of you are walking through battles. This is how you wield your sword and you gain victory. Verse 18 ends with saying, pray at all times in the spirit. Pray throughout your day. Pray for all your needs. Prayer is one of your strongest spiritual tools. You need strength, pray. You need need financial provision, pray about it. You need a relationship to be repaired in your life, pray about it. You need wisdom to know something about your job, pray about it. Pray about every concern you have in your heart. It's your lifeline to God. So it connects you to Him instantly. I wanna wrap up this morning by sharing years ago, I have always battled insecurity my whole life, but years ago, Arian and I were newly married and we were overseeing Uh, a young adults ministry. We were overseeing this discipleship program of about 50 students underneath us. We were a part of a team, but we were responsible for this group and we had staff under us. and, And I was hit with so much insecurity. Like, gosh, there's like so many people that are better suited for this. God, I can't do this. And then it was just followed up with, God, would you take this insecurity away? And I remember one night sitting in our apartment on the living room floor, we were making this whole plan for the year and coming up with the calendar. And 
And I just like broke down. And I was like, God, I have prayed so many times for you to take away my insecurity. And I just don't feel like you ever answer me. You never take away this fear. You never take away this insecurity. And I always feel like I'm just battling it over and over and over again. And I don't, I don't know how else to ask. I feel like I ask this every single day. And I felt the Holy Spirit drop Ephesians 6 in my spirit. So I went and I was like, all right, I'm gonna go look that up. So I went and I got my Bible and I looked up Ephesians 6 and I look at this armor of God passage and I'm reading it. And can I, can I just be honest with you and real? I was like disappointed because I was like, I already know that passage. I thought you were gonna give me some new deep revelation that I didn't know before. I already know that passage. I've known it my whole life. Remember, I used to pray it like invisibly over myself. I know the armor of God, but I read it and I read it again and I read it again. And I felt the Holy Spirit ask me a question. And it was this, Allison, if I, I wouldn't give you armor if I didn't intend for you to use it, right? And all of a sudden it hit me in this aha way that I had never experienced before. We pray that God will just take things away. We pray that God will just smooth out all the rough places and make it all easy. But when we read the word, we find a set of armor listed. Why would God give us armor if he's just gonna make everything easy? If he's gonna remove all the battles, we don't need the armor, right? If he's just gonna make life just sunshine and roses and there's no fight, there's no battle, we don't need armor. But yet we have armor. God's given us armor and he intends us to use it. So that night I was reminded, God wasn't taking away my insecurity. God was reminding me, I've already given you everything you need to fight it to overcome it. I've given you everything you need to follow me through your insecurity, to face it, to wield your sword, to put on your helmet of salvation and not allow those lies to penetrate your mind, to paralyze you, to stop you from doing what I've called you to do. It was a reminder that night of how powerful the word of God is because over and over and over in the Bible, God warns us. He tells us, you're gonna go through hard days. You're gonna face trials and trouble and tribulation. There's gonna be suffering. There's gonna be hardship, but I've given you everything you need, everything you need to stand in a place of victory, even when your circumstances don't look victorious yet. You can fight from a place of victory. You can fight from a place of strength because we're strong in the Lord. The process of walking through these things does not mean that God is absent. He's given us his presence and he's given us his weapons. We want a quick fix, but he's with us in the trouble, in the fire, in the rivers of difficulty. So when almighty God gives us a set of armor, we would be wise to learn what to do with it. You know, you wouldn't wanna watch your family member or your loved one walk into a battle with no weapons walk into a battle unguarded, or maybe this is a little bit closer to home. You wouldn't want your son or your brother walking out into a football game without a helmet and pads, right? That's a little bit more close to my home. You don't want that because what, it, what does that mean? That almost guarantees injury. That almost guarantees that you're gonna get taken out. And yet we walk through life. We walk through our battles. We walk through our hard times unguarded and unprotected when we don't apply the armor of God, when we don't learn what it means to pick up these tools and use them and utilize them and walk in them. So God tells us in Ephesians 6 to suit up, suit up, know the truth, choose right living so that your heart stays guarded against sin. Walk in God's peace, rooted and sure of his promises. Let your salvation impact the way you think. Hold tightly to your faith because it protects you from the enemy's attack and wield the word of God. Read it, know it, believe it and live it. From cover to cover in the book of Ephesians, Paul tells us that we are weak, but he is strong, that God chose us, that he has good plans for us, that he will see us through, that he has equipped us and he continually leads us on towards his will. One last time, verses 10 through 12, and that about sums it up. God is strong and he wants you to be strong. 
So take everything the master has set out for you, well-made weapons of the best materials and put them to use so that you will be able to stand up against everything the enemy throws your way. Amen. God has equipped us whatever it is you are facing, whatever it is you are walking through right now, you can stand from a place of victory because you have the presence of God with you. You have everything you need. You have the source with you and he will work in and through you to bring about the good, right? We can trust him. We have been equipped. Let's walk it out. Let's live it out and let's wield our sword every day. This isn't a one-time thing. It's an everyday thing. So if you need to put on some invisible armor when you wake up this week, let's do it. Let's get it in us. Let's remind our spirits what we've been given and what we're up against because God's called us to victory. Would you stand to your feet? I wanna pray over you this morning. I know Arian prayed over those of you that are walking through some battles. And I wanna pray that we would remember to grab a hold of what God's given us. I wanna pray that we would remember to walk in the strength of the Lord this week, to carry it with us in the circumstances that we find ourselves facing. And I also wanna give those of you in here, maybe you were just invited by someone, maybe you came, maybe you're not really walking with the Lord. I wanna give you a chance to do that this morning too. So would you just bow your heads and close your eyes with me today? God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is a double-edged sword. God, we thank you that your word is powerful. We thank you that you equip us. God, you know what we are walking through, God, and you know what we're capable of and you know what isn't enough. So God, thank you for equipping us. Thank you for strengthening us. Thank you for loving us enough, God, to make sure that we are equipped and protected and taken care of. Thank you for making sure that we are never without your presence. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your strength. I pray, God, that as we go through our week, that we would remember your word, God that we would walk with the shoes of peace, that we would allow our minds to be guarded and protected. I pray that we would pick up our armor, God, and that we would apply it on a daily basis so that we can stand and fight and advance the kingdom of God as you have called us to live strong in the Lord. I pray for those who are weak right now, God, that they would lean into your strength. I pray, Father God, for those that are facing hard things, God, remind them of this truth over and over and over again. You are gracious to do that and we thank you for it. God, I pray for those in this room that don't know you, God, or are far from you. Maybe they've wandered, Lord, and I just pray right now, God, your word says that if we will confess with our mouth and believe in our hearts that you are who you say you are, God, that we would receive your gift of salvation. So if that's you in here and you say, I'm not walking with God right now, but I wanna walk with God as my Lord and Savior, would you just repeat this prayer after me? Dear God, I need a Savior. I ask that you would forgive me of my sins. I thank you for sending Jesus to pay the price that I couldn't pay. Today, I receive your forgiveness and I receive your gift of salvation. And I will follow you forward from this day on. In Jesus' name. God, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. And we thank you for your mighty power that is at work within us in Jesus' name. Amen.